welcoming parent. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. I would actually like to open with a few words of gratitude about Phyllis Schlafly. Unlike some people in this room, I never knew her. But around 15 years ago, after some years spent raising children and being at home, I published my first book. And a few weeks later, I got a phone call at home. Remember when you had phones at home that people would answer? <laughs> And it was Phyllis Schlafly on the other end. And she had read the book, and she wanted to have me talk about it on the air. She had clearly taken notes. She knew everything in it. And so she kindly put me on her show. And it turned out this was not a one-off. Some years later, I published another book. She called again. We had more time on the air to discuss this. So I was so impressed that she would reach out to someone who was not part of her circles, just because of her interest in ideas. And I want to give a message to the young people in the room because it's impressive how many of you are here. Please know that you are part of an exceptionally vibrant community interested in ideas. And please work hard because you never know down the road when the next Phyllis Schlafly or someone like her is going to be calling on you to talk about your ideas. The title of my talk is How the Sexual Revolution Revolutionized Politics. There are two sets of questions that will determine the fate of the United States, and for that matter, of the entire West. The first set of questions is this. How is it that people today, unlike almost everyone who came before us in human history, have decided to live without God? And can that contemporary tendency towards secularization be reversed? <coughs> that first set of questions is explored at length in a book that I published in 2013 called How the West Really Lost God. This is it. As we've all heard, there's been a sharp rise in the number of people, especially young people, who say they believe in no organized religion at all. According to the dominant narrative that we hear on campuses and other elite venues, this is a logical development. It's happened because the new atheists won the argument, people say, or because science somehow triumphed over God or because today's people have somehow alone in history become freed from so-called superstitions. How the West really lost God examined all of those narratives and found them faulty. It came up with a very different argument. Using historical data from across several centuries, how the West really, really lost God argued that there's something else at work in secularization. When families are vibrant, religion is vibrant, and vice versa. This means that the future of the church is not a foregone conclusion, contrary to what secularists say. The future of religion is not necessarily one of endless decline. It depends instead on the vibrancy of the most important transmission belt for religious knowledge, the family. And this makes the restoration of family a matter of social urgency of the first importance. Now, the second set of questions on which the fate of the Western world depends is closely related to that first set. It's equally consequential to the world we will live, leave our children and grandchildren. One of those questions is, how is it that many Americans today are part of a crisis of identity, the likes of which has never been seen before in the world. And you can scour histories for examples. You will find nothing like the collective hysteria over identity that exists now in the countries of the West. Beneath the news cycle and the constant noise of identity politics lies a startling and unprecedented fact we are surrounded today by Americans who are confused about every aspect of themselves. 
their sexual identity, their gender identity, their ethnic identity, their national identity, and many other fundamental questions about who exactly these people are. Now, how did this massive crisis of identity happen, and what is it doing to our country and our civilization? These questions are taken up in my new book, to which Donna kindly alluded, Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. And in the time that follows, I'd like to share a short version of its argument. I wrote Primal Screams for the same reason that I wrote How the West Really Lost God, because I believe that the root cause of our national disarray and our social division has not been well understood, and that they, it must be well understood if we are ever to make things better. In How the West Really Lost God, I argued that it was the sexual revolution and its fractured fallout that explained the decline of Christianity across the West. In Primal Screams, I am arguing similarly that identity politics and the identity crisis they represent are also children of the sexual revolution. No sexual revolution, no identity politics. So here's my thesis. Our macro politics today have become a mania about identity because our micro politics are no longer familial. The diminishing of the family has come to make contemporary politics less like politics and more like a series of primal screams by lost souls who are unable to locate and ground themselves thanks to the collapse of family and faith. First, let's look at history. Why is it that no society before us seems to have endured what we are enduring, which is a shattered sense of self about the very most basic of things? The answer is that life changed radically in the decades following the sexual revolution. <coughs> And in, in the book, I have a lot of social science, almost all of it compressed to the footnotes so that the book is not hard to read, summarizing a lot of what's been assembled by perfectly secular uh, social scientists over the last 50 years. Up until the middle of the 20th century, human expectations remained largely the same that they had for thousands of years. <clears throat> that one would grow up to have children and a family that parents and siblings and extended family would remain one's primal community, and that conversely, it was a tragedy not to have a family. We see these propositions lived out in cultures across time and across the world, including today. <clears throat> but the post-1960s new social order of sexual consumerism turned every one of these expectations upside down. It has erased the givenness into which generations are born. It has deprived many people, no matter how sophisticated they are, of answering the question, who am I, in the most basic and obvious way of all, by reference to my role in a family. In part, this change is simple arithmetic. Think of all the post-revolutionary phenomena that are now everyday facts of life. Abortion, fatherlessness, divorce, single parenthood, smaller families, smaller extended families. Every one of these developments amounts to an act of subtraction. Every one of these acts of subtraction has the effect of reducing the number of people in our modern lives. And since we are relational creatures, social animals, the result is a great howling vacuum. And this, I argue, is what the increasingly panicked flight to collective identities is about. Like, 
feminist identities or other political identities or gender identities, etc. Many Americans have lost a critical mass of people in their lives from whom their learning is supposed to take place. The result is that, ironically, one of the most sexually experienced cohorts in histories is also one of the most sexually illiterate in the sense that there are fewer people from whom to learn about basic things like the opposite sex. Fewer brothers, uncles, fathers, fewer non-sexual encounters with the opposite sex thanks to all of these trends that I've summarized since the 1960s. Or to put it another way, who am I is a basic universal question and it becomes harder to answer if other basic questions are problematic. Who is my brother? Is my half-brother my brother? Is my stepbrother my brother? Is the guy who my mom's boyfriend just brought into the house my brother? Who is my father? Where is my father for many people? Or where, if anywhere, are my cousins, grandparents, nieces, nephews, and the rest of the organic connections that used to make up the building blocks of identity. A second set of evidence suggests that identity crisis is rooted in the sexual revolution as well, and that is the historical timeline. Identity politics begins in 1977, that's the first time the phrase is used, with a manifesto put out by African American feminists in which they announced that from now on, they cannot count on the men in their lives to have their backs. They can't count on their families or anyone else to have their backs. We're going to turn to each other for collective protection, is what they say. It's a very sad declaration. But note the year, 1977 is when the first generation born into the sexual revolution is coming of age. And the timeline confirms that identity politics has strengthened over the decades since. Again, in tandem with the atomized, fractured world that I'm describing. Now, it's not as if no one has noticed these connections. In his book, Bowling Alone, published 20 years ago, political scientist Robert Putnam talked about how communal associations were declining. He did not name the sexual revolution as a culprit, but it is obviously a force there. If mom is too stressed and dad is not there and the extended family has vanished, who will drive you to Girl Scouts or 4-H or make sure that you get to church in the first place? Similarly, also almost 20 years ago, James Q. Wilson, one of the most eminent social scientists of the 20th century, made a similar point and he did point to the sexual revolution as the culprit. He identified the root of America's fracturing and the dissolution of the families, which he said had led to two nations of America. The dividing line was no longer one of income or social class, he said. Instead, it had become all about the family. It is not money, he documented, but the family that is the foundation of public life. And as it has become weaker, every structure built on it has become weaker. The important take home here is that family structure had become more important than race or status at birth or any other factor in predicting the future. Now fast forward to today, where we have more and more evidence that something has gone wrong with the way we live. Declining life expectancy, mass shootings, rising psychiatric trouble, especially among the young, rising loneliness among the old, white nationalism, unprecedented drug addiction. I submit that whether left or right, these are manifestations of a panic over identity. Third, the sexual revolution appears linked to gender confusion specifically in several ways. I will just touch lightly on the, these, but please know there is an entire chapter in the book uh, documenting what I'm about to say. Primal Screams explains how 
After the sexual revolution, the incentives and disincentives to behave according to biological nature have been radically altered, more radically than ever before. Transgender bathrooms and all the other political hot buttons are just examples of what I think is a wider story. And that is the way in which the sexual revolution and the shrinking of the family increased pressure on everyone to gravitate away from the poles of masculine and feminine and instead toward an androgynous or asexual mean. There is an important take home in all of this for conservatives, especially small government conservatives. During the Reagan era and beyond, um, and I would like to add, I was privileged to serve as a speechwriter in the Reagan administration for Secretary of State George Shultz. So I know that during the Reagan era and beyond, many people dreamed about rolling back the welfare state and entitlements. But unless the family is restored through creative new policies or spiritual renewal or both, that dream will never see light. Why? because the atomized, broken, shrunken family is what keeps the welfare state in business. The state steps in or is forced to step in as a substitute, not only for the father, but for all the duties that the robust family once performed. The only road to smaller government starts with the acknowledgement that vibrant families are the key to a healthy polity. So what's to be done? As Jonathan Gilliam mentioned last night, first you have to name the problem accurately. And that's what I'm really trying to do in both of these books. Because there are a lot of people out there who think the problem is some abstraction, like the gender binary, or the patriarchy, or related uh, big words that don't mean anything. <laughs> and as long as we think that's the problem, we're never going to come up with a solution. In the end, I think that discussion over today's crisis of identity is as much a spiritual crisis as it is a political crisis. And I would like to read from the end of the book because there's an image that haunts me uh, that I want to leave with you because it explains why I do the work that I do. Anyone who has ever heard a coyote in the desert separated at night from the pack knows the sound the otherwise unexplained hysteria of today's identity politics is nothing more or less than just that. The collective human howl of our time, sent up by inescapably communal creatures trying desperately to identify their own. The fateful mismeasurement of humanity ushered in by the sexual revolution is having consequences throughout our society and politics. And those consequences are toxic. That impediment to the American future is what my work is trying to change. Thank you for listening.